Välkommen till learn.tech. En läringsdugnad om teknologi och samfund med Silvia Seres och vänner. Hello and uh, welcome to a case with Learn and BI Norwegian Business School. This is a part of the series we are creating together to explore main challenges and opportunities in creating good AI as part of BI course Responsible AI Leadership. My co-host, as in the rest of the series, is Christian Friesler. Almost correct, Christian. Almost correct, but very good. <laughs> Who's a professor of communication management at BI, and Elin Hauge, uh, who is a strategic business advisor, a professional speaker, and a startup mentor. And uh, the topic today will be the challenge of bias in responsible AI. So as in the other discussions in this um, series, I will first ask the two of you to briefly introduce yourselves. And then I would like to ask Christian to um, introduce the topic. Why are we talking about this and why are we talking with Elin? But first, Christian, who are you? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, um, Sylvia. The reason why poor Sylvia is stumbling upon my name is because I'm a part of the faculty at BI, but originally German. So my last name is German. So maybe um, a little bit cumbersome for normal ears. Also, maybe uh, this explains essentially my accent. But yeah, I'm very happy to be here with you, Ellen and Sylvia. Mm. And uh, Ellen, who are you? Uh, I'm... Norwegian, um, medical physicist and operational researcher by education uh, a couple of decades ago. It was very long ago. I worked about half my career in the insurance industry and then the other half in the consulting and IT industry. Lately, I've worked a lot in the startup ecosystem in Europe, not just in Norway. And I also work as a professional speaker, both in Norway and internationally within AI. Let me have that. <laughs> very, very good. So, um, Christian, uh, mm -hmm. what are we going to talk about today and why did you want to invite Elin to uh, be our guest lecturer? Many, many different reasons. So, for, first of all, Ellen has, I think, years of years of experience with many, many different heads, right? So, many, many different experience. And what I especially like about um, your background and what you're doing, especially for the podcast and the course, is that um, you are also, right, one of your heads is one of uh, a public educator. So essentially someone who can uh, take very complex subject matter, such as AI and discussions around why AI is in its, especially in its newer iterations, right, machine learning, deep learning, somewhat challenging. And you are um, really good in breaking it down right to essentially um, explain to people why does it matter um, how does it work and what are the different elements which essentially go into that uh, that challenge and um, we, we talked previously before and you had a really wonderful way of explaining to me like how a bias for instance works in machine learning in AI and why that is not always a bad thing why it is sometimes a thing that just is and i think in order to understand for to, to understand um what responsible ai is essentially i think we also need to talk about the notion of bias and whether we want to avoid it whether we can always avoid it um and um, how we deal with essentially the the fault in our data or not the fault in our data right but with the um idea that oftentimes artificial systems like artificial intelligence are a mirror of our oftentimes not perfect world and th that i found really 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 interesting when we had our uh, had our conversations that, that we essentially are able to really break it down for people like me to understand yes yeah, so as a speaker i very often need to kind of explain to leaders first what is ai about because even though we talk about AI in the market all the time these days, I think a lot of leaders still struggle to understand what is it really. So that's where I typically start. And the way I try to explain it is that AI is about taking mathematical recipes and then we apply these recipes to the data that we have 
in our systems, and maybe we have generated these data over 5, 10, 20 years, something like that. And then out comes a model. Now, the purpose of doing this is to replicate human decision making. And the model then helps us to predict potential future outcomes or behaviors based on the data we have. So basically, the algorithms look for patterns in the data that can be used to predict future outcomes. And it is as simple as that and as complicated as that. We can come back to the complications a bit later. Uh, uh, yeah. Elin, as an AI person myself as well, I want to expand on what you just said, because I think a really important part of AI now is that it not only replicates human decision making, but actually is able to surpass it. Sometimes it is able to see patterns in the data that a human couldn't see, and it also has now access to enormous amounts of data. So some of these data are gathered by physical sensors and are physical and therefore objective. And some of the data are based on past human decision making and behavior. And I guess that's where the worm gets into paradise. <laughs> yes. And that's where the complications come in. Because yes, as you say, these algorithms can uh, turn through much more data and find details that the human brain cannot. Um, so that's why we use these algorithms for what I would also say replication of human observation skills, because it's about replicating our ability to see. And as you say, surpass our ability to see because the algorithms can go into finer details than the human eye can do. Uh, we use them to find patterns in language and to generate language. And again, the algorithms are better than humans to go through large volumes of languages and words and across languages. Um, and then um, also just uh, enormous amounts of structured data, for example. Uh, the algorithms can again turn through much more, uh, what larger amounts of data uh, on a shorter time uh, and again surpass human decision making, but still it's own, it, it is still about replicating how the human brain works in reasoning and making decisions. Mm. So it is not magic. Mm. And that's what so I, yeah. I, I find, I, I just want to give a couple of examples here. So, so may, we make people imagine these pictures. One of the, one of the examples I want to give is, I think it was Google's uh, conference about a couple of years ago, where they started showing off these uh, deep mind in, uh, products that they have now. And uh, there was um, a video of, a, or actually a tape, a sound tape of a conversation between a, a computer uh, making uh, an appointment with a hairdresser and a real woman hairdresser mm -hmm. on the other side accepting this uh, appointment. And the thing that made the whole world stop and, you know, take a deep breath is that um, the human hairdresser in likeness with the whole of the audience in the world, did not understand that this is a computer making a, a booking. And the interesting thing is that in order to make it sound human, they put in lots of, mm, uh, you know, they, they kind of, they, they made it a bit messy. And then, and then, but it was really impossible to understand it's not uh, a human. So it's getting really good at um, uh, copying humans in a way, or, or as you said, replicating human behavior. And, and, and then the other example I wanted to give is, you know, just, just the negative side of that. And that's where I guess Christian and you, um, in introduction have been t talking to me that you know, why is bias there? Why is bias unavoidable? And, you know, why we have to learn to live with it, but in a good way. And, um, they've been trying to make these, uh, um, AI driven judges, for example, that, that would be giving out sentences to small offenders and very quickly, and they were trained on past um, offensive behavior and uh, trying to calculate, you know, the likeliness that somebody will commit a new crime uh, as they come out. And uh, they were much, much harder on um, uh, young men of uh, color than, than on others. And so we saw it wasn't fair. They were judging them harder. 
similarly, Google tried a similar project with a uh, hiring, you know, so they wanted to use past hiring data and professional experience data to see which people should they employ uh, that have the biggest potential of doing great in Google. And, and surprisingly, it was young white men that uh, seem to be doing uh, best, but of course, or that were the most hireable, but of course that's passed on past behavior, which isn't always fair or neutral, right? Yes. So back to why I wanted to explain uh, how these algorithms work on data, because that is the core, isn't it? That we train algorithms on the data that we have collected through many years, and these data are basically just a documentation of human behavior, whether it is a judiciary system or it's hiring or it's um, sales data or it's a school um, entrance record of some kind or medical treatments. It is only a documentation of human behavior. And if we were to assume that those data were fair, unbiased, uh, and of high quality, we would be assuming that humans are ras rational decision makers all the time. We are not. Only a very small fraction of the decisions we as humans make every day are in fact rational. Which means that all our not so rational decisions are also documented in the data that we use to train these algorithms. And that's where we find ourselves looking into a huge mirror when we well, come into situations where bias becomes a topic. We are actually looking at a replication of our own human behavior, which is, isn't always all that nice. We still have some of those stone age behaviors with us, right? We, we tend to take care of our, of our own tribe first. We don't like the other ones because they might be dangerous. We make sure that we feed our own first. Um, and if we can get power, we will try to get that power. All these Stone Age behaviors are somehow still with us. You know, we haven't developed that much over these some hundred thousand years, tens of thousands of years. And then we are training these algorithms to replicate human behavior, and we end up replicating human stupidity as well. Yeah. Not only not, not only replicate, but the problem with AI, I guess, is that it can <laughs> it can magnify it. It can scale it up really big yes. time. <laughs> we are scaling human thoughtlessness, actually. <laughs> yes. But but why is it unavoidable? Or or you know, is is bias ever good? Or um, or, or or is it more a matter of you know, learn to live with it and then learn to keep correcting for it? Well, so. Bias only means a preference. So in any given data set, there will always be a bias just because any data set is only a subset of the entire world, which means there will always be a bias. But bias in itself isn't positive or negative. It just is. It is a preference uh, within that data set. But the question we need to ask ourselves is what kind of bias is there? Uh, is it acceptable? And how much bias is there? Can we live with it? And if it's not acceptable and we can't live with it, then we need to do something. And this is also where the coming AI Act from the European Commission uh, is very important. And the foundation of that act is to protect the fundamental, fundamental rights of the individual, which means that we are actually stating in that act that we cannot accept bias uh, on gender, ethnicity, and other very sensitive personal parameters. So we have then in law stated, we cannot accept that kind of bias, but there will always be other types of bias. And sometimes it could be, for example, in a manufacturing process, a bias towards uh, small screws versus large screws. And does it matter? Well, maybe not. It's just a consequence of the data you have. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I will, um, I will, I will leave the floor to Christian in a second, but I, ju I just want to pull it into uh, a, another example. Um, it's good to give people these images so that they can, you know, grapple with the dilemmas themselves. And I was sitting and thinking of the driving ethics 
of a self-driving car. So there is an algorithm in there and the algorithm makes that car drive as safely as possible. And then we have many of these old ethical dilemmas in AI, the shunting problem being one of them. So let's say a kid jumps in front of the car and, you know, should the car um, hit the kid and 60% chance it might die or should the car swerve into a track next to you and kill you? Um, and, and all of this has to be built in to that algorithm somehow. And I guess these, these decisions are also not always global. I mean, in Norway, we protect the pedestrians, the weak, um, the soft uh, tra traffic participants. In, in uh, Saudi Arabia, there might not be the same preference for, you know, who do you, who do you prioritize uh, in traffic? So um, I guess many of these things also show that AI can't always be global. No. And if you extend that analogy a bit further and take more parameters into it, you see that it becomes impossible to think of it in a global perspective. Say, for example, if you were to develop um, a self-driving algorithm for the Indian market, you would train it to avoid cows, <laughs> right? But if you take that to the Norwegian market, uh, the AI could very easily mistake a moose for a cow. So it will end up avoiding the moose and hitting the killing child <laughs> or killing me. <laughs> so, and that makes no sense. Yeah. Um, and I think if you dig too much into those discussions, you end up thinking we will never have autonomous cars because how are we going to solve this? <laughs> but, 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 I but, guess there I, is, yeah. but there is a super important management perspective in what you just said. And it is that we can't leave all the AI development to global companies. Some of this needs to be managed somehow, regulated somehow at a national, local level, and it will have to be related to our values and our religion and our culture in some way in the future, right? Yes, and we might even find ourselves in a situation where um, I choose car based on what kind of algorithm does it have. Is this algorithm trained to kill me or the moose? <laughs> Just to give a kind of absurd example, but if it is transparent what the algorithm will choose, then I, as a user of the car, a buyer of the car, will also have access to that information, which means my decision might actually be impacted by whatever the algorithm is trained to do. So yes, I agree. It, it, we end up with more local decisions. But at the same point in time, that means that the leaders, the decision makers in the local market need to understand why we need to have this discussion. They can't just say, well, somebody else will have to solve it. No, <laughs> you need to understand why we have this discussion because you will eventually potentially also be responsible for the outcome. You can't leave it to the machine. And, and the citizens, the, the, the voters might actually demand to, to see how have you actively formed these tools that will be forming our society, right? Yes. And with the coming AI Act, again, um, there will be a very strict demand for transparency of the algorithms with this level of um, importance for our life and well-being, right? So there will have to be transparency, which means that, yes, of course, we will have opinions. Mm. Christian, you had a point about computational complexity versus precision. What was that about? Mm. Good question. Um, and, and, and I think I have to break it down simply because the, the idea is somewhat complex, right? But what I just found really, really interesting in your discussion, which you were having, was the point of complexity in a very general sense, right? And when, you, when, when, when we talk about... Um, yeah, the, these type of complex systems and adaptation to them um, it reminds me a little bit of this idea of the butterfly effect, right? Kind of like very little, um, very little effect small can action. have a very, yeah, small action can have a very large outcome. And um, but what I, on the one hand, find interesting is that um, 
when we talk about transparency, right, and kind of like having open discussions and giving the consumer the choice, we are, of course, then also introducing another layer of complexity in there, right, that essentially people play the algorithm, right? Um, this idea why we are very reluctant, for instance, to explain clearly how a credit, credit scoring algorithm works or how um, algorithms on social media work, right? As uh, you as an aspiring, for instance, Instagram creator, you would, of course, be very eager to learn how you get first placement, any type of um, visibility content serving algorithm right who who's get to be seen first so whenever people have incentives right not getting harmed by their car getting something um be being the first one to be recommended i think they also come then this layer of people playing the algorithm in play right so um it's an interesting discussion of like how much transparency can you really have um until human nature essentially um kicks in and when people um, start to play with that. So that's one, I think, really interesting aspect about complexity, which you point to, right, that I think most likely the solution cannot be um, one global system which will be adapted every other year or so. I guess it needs um, some type of collaborative open systems which are very much open for quicker adaptation at local levels to deal essentially with these complexities. And um, now to the question about complexity versus precision. I think, um, or um, th th this idea where, where you want to make the trade over right? having the um, best possible algorithm, the one, for instance, which serves as the best possible content that makes the best decision where there's um, freedom from error I, I think that's a very interesting discussion also I mean, well, what i mean by that um yeah you're correct to say that our world is biased right but it is also biased for the very simple reason that people have certain preferences right that though that people are getting used to uh, being used to something and um my, my, my question then essentially boils down to with how much, um, on, on the one hand, how okay are we essentially with kind of um, algorithms replicating current human preferences, so to say, right? Kind of like um, that people like this type of content prefer to have male uh, employees at, at a technology company. Or so do we, do we really want to... Um, essentially fiddle with the algorithm is that, is that something which which is a good thing to do or not hmm. good question now with the the rise of the metaverse i've asked myself the question several times how far into this digital landscape do we really want to go and is all digitalization uh, good for us should we want it and uh, on the other hand i think well I haven't a lot of people ask themselves those questions over many hundred years, and maybe I should just stop being so negative. But but I still need to. I think we need to have this um, discussion with ourselves every now and then. How much do we really need to or want to um, leave to algorithms and digital solutions? Where do we lose the human in this? Hmm. I, I want to answer that question as well. <laughs> and uh, and uh, what, what I was thinking is that, um, first of all, um, I think it's important that we have an active and kind of, you know, m moral uh, review of how are we participating in this new digital hybrid life. But I think that um, we can't, you know, decide yes or no. It's a little bit like, you know, you don't like gravity, well, too bad, you know, live with it. And I think you don't like digitalization, well, too bad, it's coming and AI is coming. So it's very much learning to walk with this new level of Gs, right? And mm -hmm. learning to live with them. And I think the complex uh, kind of moral landscape that you're painting here, both you and Christian, is super important. You know, we can't be just passively wandering in this metaverse and one hoping that, you know, somebody figures out a new, better future for us. I think we have to be asking those questions, as you mm -hmm. say. But I also think, and we had a wonderful uh, uh, discussion, um, uh, Christian and I, which will be coming in one of the later uh, sessions with a lawyer, 
a very interesting lawyer who was telling us about, uh, you know, how regulation needs to be done more at the level of principles rather than um, concrete, um, you know, rules for exactly how should the self-driving car re re regulate, you know, a cow or a moose or, but it's about, you know, if it's wildlife, um, you as a country should be able to decide maybe on a slider, you know, what priority would you give that versus, you know, a, a duck on a road versus a human on a road or, you know, there, there, there should be some sort of a higher level principles that you can give to the makers, parameterize your AI with these principles. And I think this is very important because these, our attitudes in these principles will be changing. And, you know, we can't rewrite the AI at a detailed level every second year and the data will be what it was. But, but it's a bit like, you know, the whole Me Too development. You know, the last five years, absolutely a no-go. Ten years ago, um, people wouldn't have been creating the same data, you know? So I think it, that's why it's super important to have some sort of a parametric approach to AI because the world is changing and we need to be adjusting it, right? Yes, uh, and if I can continue on that reasoning, I very much agree with you that we need to think uh, the yes and um, both development and sometimes say, well, maybe maybe not in this direction. Uh, because I think there are so many use cases where we really need these new technologies for the future of our planet, the future of our societies, of our businesses. And then there are quite a few use cases where we should maybe rethink, do we really need to apply these technologies here? And then I want to bring in one more perspective, and that is that we tend to think that anything digital is sustainable, right? Because it doesn't leave any footprints. It just floats around and there's wireless and there's data. We can't see them. But that is not correct. Anything digital has a very physical footprint. And we need to think more in terms of computational efficiency. What is the footprint of the computations I need to run my AI for this use case? And we need to take that computational efficiency into the ESG reporting and into the business cases for each digital initiative. I can give you a very small, it's a tiny startup example. I think it's kind of funny, but to me it explains uh, where maybe we should say this is too much decadence. We don't need this. And that was a, it was a startup who had come up with an idea of a hydroponic flower vase. It was just a vase for one plant, a uh, type herb or salad or something like that. And then they had added a chip to it or maybe more. Anyway, it was a digital solution in the pot to monitor the health of the plant. And then you could get the status of the plant on your mobile phone. To me, this is an example of what we do not need. We do not need an app with a data tip to monitor a plant in a pot worth about 2,000 Norwegian crowners. It has nothing to do with the future of food production. It's nothing to do with sustainability. It's only a design item, a cool gadget. But still, it has a very physical footprint because of the data tip. And mind you, the data tip, meaning the semiconductor industry, is really dirty. So it ha definitely has an environmental footprint. And then we are using data to monitor and predict the future uh, life of this plant. But it doesn't really serve any purpose other than it's a cool gadget. Mm. But on the other hand, we have all these examples within uh, renewable energy, within uh, health technologies, food production, where we really need these new technologies for a sustainable future. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a yes I, and. <laughs> I, I won't even get started on blockchain and that's <laughs> its environmental impact. But, uh, but uh, you know, go, and going back to Christian and his computational complexity and his point of, you know, these computers can calculate so much and all these many layers in deep learning and so on. Um, the, the models get more and more precise, but it has quite a big cost, as he was saying, both computationally and then precision wise. Um, you know, there, there are errors. There are mistakes. Sometimes, sometimes these uh, learning algorithms actually, uh, find patterns that are not there. I think they're called phantom patterns or so on. So, 
um, I, I guess it's as Christian was saying, perfect precision doesn't exist, right? And we need to we need to learn to live with that. Yes, uh, algorithms they just make um, assumptions based on a pattern. Uh, it is not um, a factual cause and effect answer. So there will always be errors, just like with humans. Humans make mistakes too, and we accept that. So we also need to accept that the algorithms trained to replicate and surpass humans, they also make mistakes because they also won't be better than the data we have given them to train on, right? So, yeah. so Elin, if I'm to, to kind of um, summarize what I what I'm bringing with me as as kind of the biggest uh, impression from our conversation, and then I'd like Christian to do the same mm -hmm. afterwards. I I'm thinking um, it's been a wonderful exploration of um, bias data, where data is created by past human behavior, and AI is then you know replicating our decision making and sometimes kind of putting a magnifying glass on on uh, our uh, unfair preferences from the past. Uh, so uh, rather than calling the algorithms and the data faulty, perhaps we need as humans to take our human responsibility to keep adjusting and improving. And also remembering that even with all the amazing computational power and com computational complexity that Christian was talking about, um, there will always be a need for a human in the loop. So as much as we create the faulty data and the algorithms do their job as well as they can, we are the last link that needs to make a decision and we are the only ones that should be exercising ethics and morality in this future that's algorithm-driven and data-driven. That's basically where, where, where I'm thinking. And, and, you know, managers, but also all citizens and all consumers need to remember that... Uh, AI doesn't take away that responsibility from them. It can't think for them. It can't, it can't be moral instead of them. They need to find a way to, to, to exercise that uh, action. Yes. What, what, what do you think, Christian? Everything you said, and um, in addition, um, what, 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 what I took now from your ideas, Ellen, is also this idea of thinking in layers, right? That um, it, it, it sometimes seems a little bit daunting to talk about bias, right? And say hiring is biased or um, self-driving vehicles might have some sort of bias down the road. But um, what you explained really well to us, I think, is this idea of we can break problems of bias down, right? It has many, many different components. So the idea of unfairness in hiring might uh, might be need to be broken down into global systems, regional systems, local systems. It might have um, adaptions towards industries and all that. So essentially breaking a problem or a challenge of bias down into its different continuing parts, I think makes then thinking about where do we need to tweak specifically at our specific layer, I think, easier. And maybe a related idea, which you also raised, is this idea of um, do we need um, computation and by extension then also this potential of error for this particular sub-problem on our layer or not? Or is there anything where we, for instance, can do better with any type of human oversight or a system which maybe has less precision but also then less potential for any harmful outcomes yeah so this idea of layers and um essentially thinking about trade-offs or decisions of uh, do we really need this right now given all the external circumstances i think that is something which i took from 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 your explanations yeah, I think uh, if I can give one last comment, and that is a wish <laughs> for these leaders to stop telling each other that AI is a black box and we don't mm. understand it because that is not true. We do understand the mathematics behind very well and we have understood this for about 100 years 
almost at least 80 and um, we really need to take our responsibility for the fact that these data train on, or sorry, with the, these algorithms train on the data we have given them. So we as humans are responsible for the data and the data quality and understanding the data. And only when we say, yes, I do accept that it is not a black box. I do accept that there is a mathematical recipe and I do accept that I have a uh, responsibility for those data. Only then can I, as a leader, really understand my responsibility for the decision making around how we apply these algorithms as well. I think that's a, uh, sorry, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, um, conclusion as a, as a very faulty human, I, I pressed the wrong button right now, so I couldn't find you on my screen. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, um, I think you have a, a quote that I really like, and I'd like to kind of just throw it in at the very end of our conversation. And, uh, we were asking you basically, you know, what's your general greatest worry? And you say something like that greed will surpass responsibility. And I think that's a super important uh, thought. When we are creating systems that are, you know, bigger than our markets, that are bigger than uh, our uh, financial mechanisms of uh, self-regulation, and um, what, 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 what do you think, Elin? Will we, will we, will we use AI for good? Uh, we will use AI for good, but we will also, as a total humanity. Use AI for bad. It's just the way humans are. If we had all been just good, fair and rational, we wouldn't have a war in Europe right now. Mm. And I think that is just human nature. Don't blame it on the tool, blame it on the user, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. yes, AI is just maths applied on data. Mm. You, you can't blame the mathematical recipes. They just do what we have told them to do. And we have trained them on the data. Mm. We, we as humans need to take the responsibility for what we train them on and how we apply these uh, algorithms, which can be really powerful tools for good and for bad. Thank you both very much for a very inspiring and educational chat. Thanks so much. Thank you. Du har nå lyttet til en podcast fra learn.tech, en læringsdugnad om teknologi og samfunn. Nå kan du også få et læringssertifikat for å lytte til denne podcasten på vårt online-universitet learn.university.